Hello and welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna. This is the preview show brought to you by loserpool.com with myself, Harry Simiu. And on this week's edition, we'll be looking ahead to the trip up to Huddersfield Town. We'll be talking about Shkodran Mustafi and the possibility of him being sold. We'll be talking about Arsenal's transfer budget and how Matteo Guendouzi at this age compares to a certain Cesc Fabregas. Right, let's begin by doing what we're actually here to do, and that is, of course, preview Arsenal's trip down to, well, I should say up, really, to Huddersfield Town at the weekend. Uh, took the liberty of having a quick look into Huddersfield Town, a team that I must admit I haven't seen a great deal of this season. I managed to pull off some stats and facts that should assist us in previewing this game. But before I delve into those um, I just want to remind you guys of how the game went at the Emirates earlier on in the season. That was probably one of the most frustrating afternoons um, I've experienced this season, I have to say. And uh, it was the penultimate game, I think, if I'm not mistaken, to our unbeaten run ending. Um, it was the game where Lucas Torreira popped up late on with that sort of bicycle kick of a finish, um, which ultimately proved enough for us to win the game. But if you cast your mind back, you know, we really struggled that day. Uh, we only created a couple of chances in the first half. I think one was wasted by Aubameyang and one by Lacazette. And I think that was probably one of the first games where Unai Emery selected the pair together. Because I remember coming away from that game thinking people are going to say it doesn't work now, but that that sort of fixture was probably not a true reflection of how that partnership was going to develop given the midfield that was playing behind them. It was a, a midfield three um of Xhaka, Torreira and Guendouzi. So not much creativity in there. Um, I didn't think anyway. I thought that Huddersfield were very disciplined on the day. I thought they put us under a lot of pressure in possession, particularly in the first half, and they managed to force a couple of mistakes out of Granit Xhaka. Um, and, and they made it really difficult for us. Huddersfield were really, really physical that day. Um and I, I remember being really frustrated in the ground because it felt as though a Huddersfield Town player needed to make five or six fouls before the referee would consider booking them. And then, you know, an Arsenal player would make one and, and the card would come straight out. So that was that was annoying. Um, we did play with a back three that day or back five, depending on, on how you see it. And then I guess Emery felt that because of that, he had to play that midfield trio in order to accommodate the two strikers together. But for me, it just limited us um, from a creative standpoint. And we were far too reliant on our fullbacks to, to provide the creative spark, as we have been really for most of the season, to be honest. But that day, it was particularly noticeable, um, I felt. Now, obviously, we're going to Huddersfield Town and, and they're really struggling at the moment. But it isn't going to be an easy game. They've got a new coach and they'll be looking to make an impression and getting his good books straight away as, as soon as possible. Um, just going back to that game again at the Emirates, I think it was one of the games where Emery made two halftime substitutions. Mkhitaryan and Iwobi came on for Lick Steiner and Lacazette, I think. Um, and, and I remember again thinking, why are you taking Lacazette off when we need a goal? Um, but it worked in the end. We ended up winning the game, so I'm not going to cry over sort of spilt milk. I'm not going to go back and complain about a decision that, you know, ultimately was the right one. That would be silly of me. And I know a lot of you have been quite critical of me in recent weeks and, and spoken of my negativity towards Unai Emery. And it's not an agenda. It's not that I want him to fail. It's not that I want him sacked. I just think that he's made some fundamental errors in the last few months. And to ignore that would be criminal as a supporter, I think, anyway. Um, but, of course, everybody has their own opinions, and, and that's what football's all about at the end of the day. But I do think that going up to Huddersfield this weekend, we're going to need some protection from the referees. They, they like to put it about. Um, I haven't seen them play under their current manager, if I'm being honest, so I'm not sure if that approach has changed in any way. But... Certainly under David Wagner, they came there very organised and very physical. And, and I felt that 
in that particular game and on that particular day, Arsenal really struggled with that. Now, let's take a look at some of those facts and figures that I mentioned right at the top of the show. Uh, I'm going to start off with Huddersfield Town's league position at the moment. Uh, they are rock bottom in the Premier League. And at the moment, you know, they're quite a way off safety. It's around about 13 points, I think. Um, let's just quickly calculate that. Yeah, 13 points. It's a massive gap, isn't it? Um, and you have to assume that they're doomed this season. Uh, Burnley up in 17th on, on 24 points. And Huddersfield down in 20th only have 11. In fact, there's a six-point gap between them and Fulham, who currently sit in 19th place. Uh, so that's really worrying. And I guess Huddersfield getting into the Premier League in the first place was them punching above their weight. So, you know, if they go back down, I don't think they'll be too disappointed as a club. I think it, it, it's something they would have expected. And the good thing about Huddersfield is they haven't spent extortionate amounts of money and, and brought lots of high profile players in on, on ridiculous wages like Fulham have, for example. And so relegation probably won't hurt them too much. They've been sensible in the way they've run their club. They knew that uh, coming up was a huge achievement and they probably wouldn't be able to sustain it. So they were responsible in the way they went about their transfer business and that should be applauded. Um, looking at their last five results, their last result was a, a battering at Stamford Bridge where they lost 5-0. Uh, the Tuesday before that, they lost at home to Everton by a goal to nil. Um, the weekend before that, they lost at home to Manchester City by three goals to nil, which is uh, not a score line to be ashamed of, um, to be honest, is it? Manchester City are a fantastic side. Uh, the last time they avoided defeat came on Saturday, the 12th of January, when they earned a nil-nil draw at Cardiff. Um, so... Uh, that was the last time they didn't get beat. But then the game before that on the Wednesday night, no, the Wednesday before that, Wednesday the 2nd of January, uh, Burnley went to uh, Huddersfield Town and won by two goals to one and, you know, opened up an even bigger lead between the two clubs and, and ultimately sort of buried um, buried Huddersfield for good, I think, if, if we're being completely honest. Now, I've spoken about the last time the two teams met at the Emirates earlier on in the season, but incidentally, the last time we went to the John Smith Stadium, um, it was Arsene Wenger's last ever game as Arsenal manager, so it was a really emotional afternoon. Um, I know a lot of you guys would have been there and, and remember it fondly. Um, it had a bit of a weird atmosphere to it, didn't it? It felt as though the game was a... a a side attraction to the main event, which was Arsene Wenger saying goodbye to the Premier League. The Huddersfield Town fans were great, I've got to say. They paid tribute to him and, um, you know, they showed their class there. Now, looking at goals, it's been a real problem for Huddersfield Town. If you look at some of the statistics, and these came from PremierLeague.com, uh, there was a stat of uh, goal scorers, where, sorry, there was a stat where all the goal scorers were listed um, since Huddersfield came into the Premier League. And the top goal scorer is Steve Mounier with eight. Now, that is over a season and a half. So that shows you, doesn't it, how much they're struggling in front of goal. De Poitras is in second. He's joined uh, there with Aaron Moy, who's also got six. And then after that, it's Zanka in fourth. So bearing in mind that these stats cover the time since Huddersfield came into the Premier League it shows you that they've got a real problem in front of goal um, and ultimately you know that that's going to cost them isn't it you can't stay in this league um, if you don't score goals and them like many of the other clubs around them uh, have that problem at the minute now David Wagner who done a fantastic job there obviously bringing them uh, into the Premier League he left uh, a little while ago it was quite not really a surprise actually because I thought he would go I thought he'd move on to bigger and better things eventually um, I was surprised at the timing of it it was an announcement made by the club where they said that it was by mutual consent um, I'm not sure that that's ever really the case is it uh, when we're talking about managers leaving football clubs perhaps uh, David Wagner had asked for transfer funds going into this window and the club just said look the likelihood is we're going to go down and we don't really want to lay any more money on the table and perhaps that's where a disagreement may have occurred and the, the two decided to part company. I don't know, I'm only speculating. Um, but after David Wagner left, they appointed Jan Seawert, who 
is a German manager. He's 36 years old. Uh, really young for a manager, really, isn't it? Um, he used to play as a defensive midfielder um, for TUS Mayen in Germany. Um, but he's he's been around a little bit as a manager. Not really at, at the top level, though. It's been more sort of... Uh, running reserve teams in under-19 sides, in academy sides. He started at Rotweiss Essen uh, in Germany, and then he managed VFL Bochum's under-19s. And most recently, he was the uh, the boss of Borussia Dortmund's second string. So, you know, he, he's got experience at a big club, but is it top-level experience? You have to say no. Um, he, he will have... A good understanding of of young players, I guess. He's probably got a good knowledge of sort of the academies around the the Bundesliga clubs. And you'd hope, from a Huddersfield standpoint, that he'll be able to pick out a few gems from from those divisions and hopefully aid his team. But in terms of top-level experience, there's not a great deal there um, on that CV. So it'll be interesting to see how he gets on. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know a lot about how Huddersfield are going to set up for this one. Um, under David Wagner, I would have probably said they'll be very organised, tough to beat, uh, plenty of men behind the ball and hoping to, to do some damage on the counter-attack. I want to say that it's probably going to be the same sort of approach, um, not because I know much about this manager, but because that seems to be the general approach, doesn't it, for for teams sort of lower down the pecking order when they're trying to contain some of the big boys. I think from an Arsenal standpoint, it's very important that we have some creative flair in our team. Um, those of you who listen to this show regularly will know that I felt that that's something that's been missing of late. And and the reason for that, in my view, has been down to Unai Emery's team selections. I think he's got a lot of things wrong, as I said earlier on in the show. And... Um, you know, hopefully he can put some of that right and, and we can go on a little bit of a run because we've got some pretty good fixtures now um, for for a couple of weeks at least um, before the big North London derby comes up. So, you know, it's really important that we get these points on the board. Chelsea are, are going to Manchester City this weekend. So, you know, it's vital that we register maximum points. Unai Emery has been speaking in his press conference uh, today, actually, ahead of this one, about the fact that we need to improve our waveform, where this would be a great time to, to start. Um, it, the good thing about Unai Emery, I guess, is that he does recognise uh, Arsenal's flaws, and I think the thing that he does well is he, he, well, he tries anyway to communicate those to the supporters, whereas Arsene Wenger kind of took a different approach, didn't he? It was always about keeping those sort of things in-house. I think as fans, when you're being asked to be patient with a manager um, and patient with a project, it's nice to know that even if results have been okay and, and we are in the race for the top four, that Unai Emery recognises there's a lot of work still to be done. Uh, he did fill us in on some team news. Shkodran Mustafi is in full training, so he's expected to be available this weekend. Henrik Mkhitaryan is also back in full training, uh, so the hope is that he will feature at some point. Granit Xhaka, however, um, has a problem with his left groin. Uh, it was the problem that kept him out of the last game. He's being assessed uh, ahead of, of this trip to Huddersfield Town, so we'll have to wait and see on that one. As is Ainsley Maitland-Niles, he's also being assessed for a problem with his right knee. Um, no return for Socrates, as we know he'll be out until the end of February. And of course, Bellerin, Holding and Welbeck are all long-term absentees. So my prediction for this one, I'm going to go for an Arsenal win. I'm going to be positive this week. Um, I know I've been a little bit negative of late, but like I said, uh, I've got my reasons. But this week I'm feeling as though it's a really good opportunity for Arsenal to register maximum points and put the pressure on Chelsea before they go to Manchester City. So uh, fingers crossed we can do that. I'm going to go for an Arsenal win and I'm going to go for a 3-1 win because the thought of Arsenal keeping a clean sheet um, just doesn't seem a realistic one. So Huddersfield Town 1, Arsenal 3 is my prediction for this one. Another subject I want to touch on is the reports emerging uh, over the last few days that Arsenal are set to 
offload Shkodran and Mustafi in the summer uh, in a desperate attempt to boost the transfer budget uh, for the summer window. And, you know, I don't really take too much issue with that, if I'm being honest. I don't think that Mustafi's good enough for this football club. I don't think I've ever thought him to be uh, at the level required. But what I will say is there is a little bit of an agenda against him from some of our supporters that I feel is a little bit uncalled for. It's a little bit over the top in the sense that, you know, he, he's bad, but he's not much worse than the rest of the defenders that we have at the club. For example, you know, Lauren Koscielny, for me, was finished years ago, yet for some reason he gets a free pass uh, in the eyes of some of our supporters. And, you know, when he makes mistakes, then they're, they're not as highlighted, maybe. And it just feels a bit unfair. The fact that we're talking about offloading Mustafi tells you that he's the only one with any value. So then, you know, it kind of makes a mockery of that point that he's the worst defender, doesn't it? Because if he is the worst defender, why is it that he's the only one that realistically would command the transfer fee? And this might be a controversial statement, but, you know, when Rob Holdings fit um, and back uh, on the pitch for Arsenal, you know, you could say he's young and he's got lots of promise, but I don't think he'd command anywhere near the transfer fee that Shkodran Mustafi would because their CVs are so different, aren't they? I mean, Mustafi's played for Valencia, he's played for Everton for a little while in the Premier League, he's played for Arsenal now for quite some time, um, and he's won a World Cup. He's played for Germany uh, at right-back, at centre-back, and, and that carries some weight, doesn't it? So I just wanted to make that point. I feel as though Mustafi gets a bit of a rough time from some of our supporters, not... Um, in the sense of, you know, they should be praising him. But what I mean by that is he deserves plenty of criticism, but so do others. And I feel that the level he receives is probably uh, a little bit disproportionate to what the actual situation tells us. I want to hear what you guys think on that one. Do you think that the criticism of Mustafi is a little bit over the top? Do you feel that he's the worst centre-back at Arsenal? Do you feel he's the best of a bad bunch? What are your views on Shkodran Mustafi? Let me know. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. Now, my next point of discussion on this week's preview show is the transfer budget. There were reports uh, earlier on in the week that Arsenal would only have £45 million to spend Social media went into meltdown, including me, to be honest. Um, I, I probably reacted to that report a little bit prematurely, a little bit earlier than I should have. Um, I, I will hold my hands up. I think I got it wrong. I think um, my reaction was a little bit over the top. But at the end of the day, given the current situation and given the fact that we were told in in this January window that we didn't have the money, um, for whatever reason, to sign players on a permanent deal, uh, I think it was kind of like the tipping point for me it was to hear that you know um i've since watched a lot of, of videos read a lot of really interesting threads um from some people with a greater knowledge than me uh, of the club's finances and i've since come to realize that that's probably not going to be the case um in the summer so i hold my hands up there uh, but one video that I watched in particular that really explained it well uh, was the video put out by Lee Gunner. So if you haven't seen that, head over to his uh, YouTube channel. I retweeted it from my personal Twitter at Harry Simu the other night. So uh, if you're struggling to find it, just uh, go onto my page there and you'll see it. But yeah, uh, I just wanted to make that point because it's something that I reacted to uh, pretty quickly. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was 45 million, but from what I've read and, and what I've heard, it, it makes sense that, you know, maybe the club were holding back a little bit this January uh, for the purpose of being able to go and spend bigger money in the summer. So time will tell, I guess. Um, but yeah, you know, um, we're all fans. We're all emotionally charged when it comes to this football club. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. I lost my rack on Twitter the other day. Now, my last point for discussion on this week's preview show, before I wrap it up, uh, is around Matteo Guendouzi. And, you know, I've been reading lots of things about Guendouzi of late, and, and throughout the season he's been praised an awful lot, um, and, and most of the time deservedly so. But um, what I will say is I still don't think we should be relying on a 19-year-old uh, to be carrying our midfield. I think he's played 
far too many minutes this season, more than he should have, more than he himself would have expected to play. Uh, so that's one thing. But I've read a few comparisons this week between him and a 19-year-old Cesc Fabregas. And I, I really wanted to make this point because I think it's really valid. Matteo Guendouzi is a hard worker. He's clearly a passionate footballer. Um, he's always in the thick of the action. He doesn't seem to be phased by anything. And that's admirable, isn't it? F- particularly for a player of his age. So fair play to Matteo Guendouzi. I think he's got a bright future ahead of him. Uh, whether I think he should be in the team week in, week out is, is another matter. Not one that I'm going to get into again now. Uh, but I just think that those comparisons to Cesc Fabregas are ridiculous. Um, Cesc Fabregas went to went on to achieve a great deal um, after he left Arsenal Football Club, and he was a fantastic player for us. Uh, technically gifted, brilliant football brain, um, you know, could pick out any pass, had incredible vision. There is no way that you can tell me Matteo Guendouzi, uh, from a technical standpoint, is at that level. And I challenge anyone, really, to, to debate me on that because I'm sick and tired of reading things like that. I know people have a bee in their bonnet when it comes to Cesc Fabregas because of the way he left the club. But as a football fan, as a football man, surely you can see that the two players are worlds apart um, and were, and you know go back in time and put a 19-year-old Cesc in comparison with Guendouzi to be fair about it even then. Um, there's quite clearly a, a massive gulf in class. And I just wanted to make that point because I'm sick and tired of reading nonsense like that. Um, and it's a bit like the Ashley Cole thing, isn't it? I think he was on Sky Sports the other night. I saw his uh, chat with Jamie Carragher after the game. And he was asked, wasn't he, about his time at Arsenal. And he spoke quite fondly of it. And it makes you realise, doesn't it, when everything calms down, when the emotion uh, is put to one side, then you start to remember what a good player Ashley Cole was for Arsenal. And it's a shame, isn't it, that a move or a transfer or whatever can sort of mask all of that. And I've been very careful not to do that when it comes to Cesc Fabregas. I've been very um, careful to make sure that, you know, when talking about his move to Chelsea, I don't discount the fact that he was a fantastic servant to Arsenal Football Club before he left, um, as was Ashley Cole. And it just made me realise that, you know, no matter what happens as a football fan and, you know, as a lover of the game, you should be able to look back on a player um, and look back on his time at your club, Alexis Sanchez, another example, and and recognise just how good they were, uh, no matter what's gone on since. So, uh, you know, Matteo Guendouzi, great prospect, great footballer but not in the same league as Cesc Fabregas. And I don't think he ever will be. But that's my opinion. Let me know what you think. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. That brings us to the end of another preview show. Huge thanks to every one of you for tuning in. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and iTunes and uh, whatever other platform it is that you're listening from. Uh, Thank you for your continued support and we'll be back next week looking back at the game against Huddersfield Town, hopefully looking back on a victory. Until then, take care.